Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, it is my honour to address the Human Rights Council on behalf of the Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries as a means of violating human rights and impeding the rights of people to self-determination. At the outset, the Working Group would like to thank Member States, UN agencies, national human rights institutions, intergovernmental and non-governmental organisations, non-state actors, investigative bodies, academic institutions, civil society organisations, and all other stakeholders who have taken the time to share their experiences and views in order to strengthen the implementation of our mandate. Today, I am pleased to present our annual thematic report on the role of mercenaries, mercenary-related actors, and private military and security companies in the trafficking and proliferation of arms. This is a topic of utmost importance and requires the urgent attention of this council. And the working group hopes to further engage with you on addressing the challenges that we have identified in our report. The working group extends its gratitude to all stakeholders who participated in our expert consultations and responded to our call for inputs and for their valuable contributions which helped inform the thematic report. Mr. President, as this working group has continuously reported, the recruitment, financing, use and transfer of mercenaries, mercenary-related actors and private military and security companies in any context prolongs conflicts, amplifies levels of violence, undermines peace efforts, destabilizes communities and substantially increases the risk of violations of international human rights, humanitarian and criminal laws, including but not limited to the commission of gender-based violence, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Despite this trend of armed conflict-induced human suffering, global military spending continues to surge. In recent years, the working group has noted a discernible shift in the dynamics of warfare, characterized by diversification and proliferation of actors engaged in conflicts, inclusive of mercenaries, mercenary-related actors, and private military and security companies. A proliferation of the availability and types of arms, ammunition, and weaponry used by mercenaries, mercenary-related actors, and private military and security companies, and an increasing nexus between mercenaries, mercenary-related actors, and private military and security companies, as well as arms proliferation, illicit networks, and financing. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, mercenaries, mercenary-related actors, and private military and security companies have been known to deliver military and security services within their scope of operations, ranging from recruitment, logistical assistance, training, counsel, arms procurement to on-the-ground combat. The working group has identified four main ways that mercenaries, mercenary-related actors, and private military and security companies are connected to the illicit and illegal arms trade. The first method is through the direct state supply of arms via state sponsorship, state contracting, and or state rerouting. The second is through the illegal sale or seizure of state stockpiles and armories known as diversion. The third is through legal, illegal, criminal and opaque brokering networks, shell companies and intermediaries. And the fourth method is by means of illicit channels from and between mercenaries, mercenary-related actors, and private military and security companies themselves and or combatants. Mr. President, every day civilians bear the brunt of the accumulation, diversion, illicit transfer, and misuse of arms. Weapons have a clear direct an indirect effect on the enjoyment of a wide range of human rights, including political, civil, economic, social, and cultural rights. Unlike the trade in most other goods, arms transfers exact a deadly toll. Furthermore, 
When there is an enabling environment for illicit operations involving arms transfers by mercenaries, mercenary-related actors, and private military and security companies, persons in vulnerable situations owing to factors including gender, age, poverty, geographical location, indigenous background, national or social origin, birth, minority, disability, or other status, may experience heightened exposure and vulnerability. This can have long-lasting consequences on future generations. The most vulnerable regions are often those that are conflict-prone, involved in prolonged armed conflicts, and who have vulnerable political situations, leading to further destabilization and potential human rights violations. Current governance and regulatory endeavors lack transparency, comprehensiveness, monitoring, and compliance in preventing and addressing and mitigating the negative human rights impact of arms transfers, including the diversion of arms and unregulated or illicit arms transfers, thus hindering the ability to adequately manage the conduct of mercenaries, mercenary-related actors, and private military and security companies. Regrettably, the implementation of human rights considerations and legal responsibilities are subverted by commercial and security interests. While states may have legitimate concerns to national security, international law is also clear that such justifications cannot override the obligations of the state to respect the internationally guaranteed fundamental freedoms and human rights of all persons. These obligations apply to any state with jurisdiction over the transfer of arms, military and security services, as well as the export, import, offshoring, transit, transshipment, brokerage, licensing, and production of arms. With regards to private military and security companies, the working group notes existing multi-stakeholder regulatory initiatives such as the Montreux document, the International Code of Conduct for Private Security Providers, and the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights. However, it reiterates that a comprehensive, legally binding, international regulatory instrument will ensure consistent regulation worldwide and adequate protection of human rights affected by the activities of PMSCs. Other key supplied actors in the private sector, such as arm companies, banks, financial institutions, arms dealers, arms brokers, and investors, contribute to the production and proliferation of arms, bear their own responsibilities to undertake systematic and periodic human rights due diligence in line with established human rights norms and standards. In that sense, the regulation, governance, and decision-making process should occur through a preventative and protective human rights-based approach to disarmament and arms control, to ensure respect for the fundamental principles of participation, accountability, the rule of law, equality, and non-discrimination. Importantly, the regulation of these actors and entities places disarmament and arms control firmly within the sustainable development agenda. In particular, SG target 16.4 explicitly reflects on the importance of reducing illicit arms flows and arms control to promote peace, security, and sustainable development. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, let me now turn to the country visit report of the working group to Côte d'Ivoire visited from 4 to 13 March 2024. The working group is grateful to the government of Côte d'Ivoire for extending the invitation to visit the country and extends its appreciation to those who made this important follow-up visit possible. Since the previous visit of this working group in 2014, Côte d'Ivoire has made considerable progress in achieving stability, rebuilding its core institutions, strengthening the security sector, and ensuring socio-economic development. 
Notably, the government of Côte d'Ivoire has implemented various economic programs to promote sustainable livelihood opportunities of the most marginalized segments of the population, with specific initiatives targeting women and youth. The working group recognizes that to a large extent, Côte d'Ivoire succeeded in addressing security issues at the outset of its transition process in 2011. The working group also notes with appreciation that a large number of recommendations it issued following its visit in 2014 were implemented. Specifically, the working group welcomes the in inclusion and definition of rape and other crimes of sexual nature in the newly adopted Criminal Code of 2019, as well as efforts taken by authorities to combat violence against women. The working group also welcomes the establishment of a national civil registry. More attention now needs to be placed on Ivorian security sector reform, as recent political and security developments in neighboring countries, including the presence of extremism, jihadism, and of foreign private military actors may possibly spill over and impact on the country's still fragile security and political stability. Côte d'Ivoire's dual response to the extremist jihadi violence on its northern borders and to the risk of predatory recruitment by mercenary-related actors seems to have borne fruit, both in military terms and in terms of economic development initiatives. In line with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals, Côte d'Ivoire will need to continue to look behind the symptoms to tackle the structural causes and drivers of poverty, inequality and social injustice in order to create conditions for a free, just and socially sustainable future. The working group calls on the Ivorian government to continue its strategies to reinforce security along its northern borders as well as to strengthen the programs to alleviate poverty and unemployment in the area, with the overall objective of preventing the recruitment, including predatory recruitment of mercenaries and mercenary-related actors, including extremist groups and foreign private military companies. The working group urgently calls on the strengthening of Côte d'Ivoire's private military and security regulatory framework which to date remains unsatisfactory, to tackle the risks created by the ever-increasing presence of foreign military personnel in neighboring countries. Specifically, there is an urgent need to regulate these operations and services of private foreign military actors. The working group calls on the international community to step up its international cooperation and to work in close partnership with the government of Côte d'Ivoire to achieve its goals. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates. Year after year, our country visits, the MATIC reports and communications highlight the necessity of states to put in place stronger legislative frameworks without delay to universally prohibit mercenary and mercenary-related activity, as well as regulate the use of private military and security companies through domestic, regional, and global accords. On behalf of the Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries, we would like to thank the Government of South Africa for its chairmanship, as well as convening and organizing the sessions of the IGWG on PMSCs. We would also like to thank them for inviting the mandate to contribute to the discussion on the future instrument, which we have encouraged to be legally binding if we are to achieve the effective regulations of PMSCs. The working group would also like to take this opportunity to thank member states who have extended an invitation to our mandate to undertake a visit to their country, most recently the government of Cyprus. We look forward to continued exchanges and cooperation. The foregoing report were presented in the spirit of constructive engagement and dialogue. I hope to continue the positive engagements with more states and stakeholders in the forthcoming days. I look forward to a fruitful interactive discussion with you and remain open for your questions and comments. Thank you all for your attention.